Right, so I'm going to kick us off this morning. Um, I'm sure people are going to be joining throughout. But good morning, welcome, and thank you for joining us this morning for How to Innovate. Um, this series of events has been designed uh, and created to bring speakers from a diverse range of different sectors and backgrounds to share their experiences over the past year and how we can all innovate, collaborate, and lead more effectively. Um, but before we introduce the speakers and before we go into today's session, I want to quickly say who we are and, and what Heffel Innovation is. Uh, if you're not aware of who we are, you may know the sites that we run, and, that, and they are Heffel Engineering Centre and Scottish Enterprise Park. And, and what we do is across those sites and across Norfolk and Suffolk is we incubate. So within uh, Heffel Engineering Centre and Scottish Enterprise Park, we provide businesses with space to grow, as well as on, on site uh, business support. In terms of that business support, we help businesses within the sites and across North and Suffolk to innovate and to accelerate. And we do that currently through EU funded training, workshops, events, and bespoke one-to-one -one support, which we're currently funded to deliver to the end of this year. Before we get started, I want to launch a quick poll. I want to see how our morning rituals change and the other to see what innovation means to you. So I'm going to launch the polls now. So let us know what drink your choice best start the day. Maybe times are tough. Maybe a bottle of whiskey is, is required for some days. And then also let us know what innovation means to you. A number of different choices, creativity, bravery, money, excitement, improvement, or is it difficult? Obviously, there's a lot more ways to describe innovation, but these are just a few. So I'll give you just another few seconds to vote on this now. I think the majority of you have, have voted. And interestingly, we've had coffee come out on top. A nation of tea drinkers and coffee is the best way to start the morning. No one wanted to opt for or perhaps admit a bottle of whiskey was the best way to start. Uh, and innovation, what it means to you, so creativity, but also excitement and improvement. So a nice bit of diverse um, results there for that. So how to innovate first of three sessions that we've put together um, with how to collaborate taking next week and how to lead taking place the week after. And obviously, if you want to sign up for those following the session, you can find all the details on our website or on our Eventbrite page. Over the next hour and a half, we hope that you hear from speakers you typically wouldn't hear from and you typically wouldn't group together and hope that you discover similarities and stark differences between the, the uh, sectors that you operate in and how these findings, opinions, and experiences felt over the last year could be implemented into your organization. The session will begin with our panelists providing a five minute lightning talk, um, sharing how they and the organizations around them have been able to innovate over the last year. We'll then go into our Q&A section where you can ask our panelists what's on your mind or anything you'd like to expand upon. A recording will be made available following the session so do not fear if for whatever reason you need to pop off or are unable to stay for the entire event. I'm delighted to welcome our panel. So first of all, we've got Louise Jopling from the Eastern Academic Health Science Network, Chris Woodward from Innovate UK Edge East of England, which is formerly the Enterprise Europe Network. We have Sarah Steed from Norwich University of the Arts, Ismat Iman from Whilst, which is formerly known as Kipple, and we also have Imogen Shipley from Hethel. So, before we kick off into our talks, I want to ask you one final question, and I want to know how the last year has been for you, affected by COVID-19. So, how do you agree with this statement? The conditions created in the last year have made it easier for our organisation to innovate. Would you say you strongly agree with this statement? Agree? neither agree nor disagree? Or would you say you disagree and strongly disagree with that? So we've got some answers coming in now. 
some really interesting answers. Give you just another five or ten more seconds to to rack your brain what actually has happened in the last year if you didn't know we are now in 2021 which I, we may have missed a year um just to let you all know so i'll give you two more seconds to answer here so you can see diverse range some have found it incredibly easy and, and strongly agree with this statement whereas some maybe not so and some kind of erring and erring kind of trying to forget what happened last year so i'll stop those results now and we'll move on to our first talk so louise has been with the eastern academic health science network since 2019 and helps develop partnerships between industry to accelerate the to accelerate update and the adoption of health innovations to support NHS needs in the Eastern region. Um, as an immunologist, Louise has worked across the spectrum of therapeutic research, development and commercialization, including product launch and life cycle management. So Louise, I'm going to hand over to you for our first lightning talk. Well, thank you. Welcome, everybody. So I work for Eastern Academic Health Science Network, or AHSN, um, and just very briefly, our organisation, we are the innovation arm of the NHS. We are funded by the NHS and the Office for Life Sciences. And yes, we, our primary mandate is to support the uptake, uh, accelerate in fact, the uptake, adoption and spread of innovation within our health and care system. Um, within the east of England, but also as part of a network, national network of AHSNs. Um, to spread that nationally, but also we're doing a lot of work internationally as well, so that might be important to, to the audience members. I think the second piece that we um, are conscious of is that economic growth, and that's for both our region, for UK PLC and the SMEs um, starting and scaling up within the, the country. I guess what I've seen um, as sort of trends across health and care that COVID has, um, has actually enabled. So I, I would have been one of those, had panellists been able to vote, that would have strongly agreed that um, COVID has given us some huge, unique opportunities, particularly in the sector that I'm working in. I think, first of all, some um, real examples, a lot of innovators um, rapidly pivoted their technology and what they were working on to address and to pivot that towards um, addressing COVID and supporting the health and care system. So in March, April, we were incredibly busy with what I describe as a tsunami of innovation um, that was uh, needed for our system. I think the other piece is the rapid scale and deployment of digital technology for our NHS and within our NHS. So those barriers that were of getting certain innovations into our health and care system really flattened. So that was financial, but it was also some of the, not regulatory, but some of the, um, some of the barriers that had existed historically were, were removed. And we hope there will be a place where they start to come back, but we hope that we can continue and capitalize on that to streamline getting that innovation um, taken up in the first place, but rapidly deployed. I think the third and final piece I just want to um, highlight is coming together of industries that didn't historically work together and didn't work within health and care. So we, we know of the automotive industry and particularly in Norwich, that was very, very strong, but nationally as well. The automotive industry coming together with innovators and entrepreneurs to address the ventilator challenge. That still remains a challenge, but you know, Mercedes, et cetera, we can name all, all sorts. But what, and, and I was tasked with this from one of our system healthcare leads in Norwich, was how can we keep that um, cross fertilization of expertise, you know, so that it doesn't just dissipate as and when, if and when COVID disappears, that we can keep that. And that's something that I'm working across a number of sectors and with the New Anglia LEP and particularly George Freeman MP on a Norfolk Suffolk restart initiative. So 
how can we support those businesses across a number of sectors, agriculture, digital, etc., to bounce back better, but actually bounce forward and, and really garner the, um, the innovation that is, exists today, but that future forward for our counties. So I'm going to pause there, Jordan. I'm happy to pick up on any points. Brilliant. I even have to give you the warning. <laughs> So um, what we'll do, all questions that you have, we will wait till uh, all of the lightning talks are over. So if you do have any questions, please do pop them in the Q&A section and we can come back to them um, when we come into that part of, of the event. Next up, we have Chris from Innovate UK Edge, formerly the Enterprise Europe Network. Uh, Innovate UK Edge is the world's largest support network for small and medium sized enterprises, with international ambitions. And within the incredible amount of support they provide. Chris specialises in UK and EU grant funding and environmental technologies. I'll pass over to you, Chris. Brilliant, thank you very much, Jordan. Um, I'm showing my slides now, can everyone see that? Yeah. Brilliant, so as Jordan said, um, Innovate UK Edge is probably new to a lot of you. It's been uh, a new brand which has been put forward by Innovate UK, um, partly because of Brexit and the change of our funding bodies but we were formerly known as the Enterprise Europe Network. So now we provide a tailored innovation and growth support program for between five and seven days of coaching and mentoring support for innovative UK SMEs. So as a service with Innovate UK, we believe that innovation should be a driving force for any type of business around, it could be around products, it could be around services, any type of thing. And certainly the COVID situation has presented us uh, with more funding from Innovate UK and the government to provide support to companies. And there's been a bit of a shift in what we did pre-COVID and now in that we're not so much looking at long-term growth. That is obviously still on the agenda for a lot of companies, but we're also helping companies to survive and stabilise throughout the pandemic as well. So it's been a big shift in how we support companies, but there are many, many topics that we've been helping companies with. And I think certainly from the first lockdown period, we've noticed with companies that there's been a bit of an opportunity to sit and take stock of the situation and reassess their, their business model and, and how they approach um, their markets. And I think certainly with Louise, um, there have been various different markets that have seen huge opportunities for innovation and growth. Um, but obviously there are other markets where similar to other times where there's economic downturns or financial crisis, there's a bit of a survival of the fittest situation. So it's a case of helping companies to assess what their business model is and how they could probably innovate even through processes internally to really make the most um, of the situation survive and then also provide a long-term pathway to growth as well. So when we're talking about all of these different innovation areas, whether it's um, process, product or uh, service, there are some key areas that we really have to look at. And these are the key types of topics that we're working with companies at the moment around. Uh, so assessing the problem or the market opportunity that you're dealing with, your actual value proposition and the customer base that you are targeting on top of that, we also have to look at competitor analysis. And I think this is particularly pertinent at this moment in time to see right, how are your competitors operating within the marketplace? Are there niche opportunities where you could pivot or change your business model to make you stand out and have that competitive advantage? So that, I think, has probably been the key area for companies that aren't developing new products or processes or haven't seen tech and, and innovation opportunities through COVID to really reanalyze, change their model and try and pick up new opportunities going forward. But obviously there are situations where, as Louise said, new innovation projects, uh, whether it's radical or incremental innovation, there are opportunities out there. And we're not just talking about healthcare as well. So it's all about developing your innovation projects and subsequently also the commercialization and exploitation strategy for that because it isn't something that you can do on the fly. I think whether it's business um, business models, processes, services, or products, you have to have a good plan and strategy for what you're going to do over the next three to five years. So it's all about getting the right strategy in place, 
mapping all of that out and then executing it as well. And the most important thing with innovation as well, if we're talking specifically about product innovation, is the equal or uh, good balance between the technical aspects of it, but also the commercial opportunities, because there's always got to be a commercial opportunity in the back end in which you're looking to exploit. Obviously, the UK government has actually been trying to stimulate or support uh, the UK economy at this time as well. So Innovate UK, the UK government's innovation agency, they have a number of funding calls, uh, which are all, always out there. Some of the most popular ones, the smart calls, which is an open call, but also the industrial strategy challenge fund, which aligns very closely with government's industrial strategy, so topics such as uh, clean growth. But on top of that, um, Rishi Sunak has also been providing new funding opportunities, such as the COVID response program. So that again, that will align very closely with what uh, Louise has been doing in funding uh, new products and innovations that actually re rely and focus on responding to the COVID pandemic. But there's also been the Sustainable Innovation Fund and Innovation Continuity Loans. And I must say from personal experience with clients that have been going for this and also looking at the response rates for these programmes, all of the programmes are massively over, overly subscribed this year. So huge amounts of companies and UK innovative SMEs are looking at this in a way to generate new opportunities, generate new revenue streams via, via product development. So, the government has been helping to do that, but obviously at the same time, money can only go so far, but there are grant opportunities out there and this will be continuing going forward with new programmes and new opportunities through Innovate UK. So it's always worthwhile keeping in touch with ourselves and also Innovate UK and UK government to see what is out there on their funding courses. So some of the key topic areas that we typically cover through our business support services. So managing cash flow again, that's been very important um, at the moment through COVID. So rationalizing product ranges, uh, looking at profitability and profit margins on different product ranges. So you're actually streamlining your revenue streams, um, reviewing business models, looking at the customer base, um, supply chain development because and management because you've had the added bonus Brexit being thrown in there as well. So reassessing supply chains in a pandemic with Brexit as well for European markets has been an extra challenge, but another key topic that we've been helping companies with. Um, staff retention, uh, we've obviously had to support companies with furlough schemes and, and how they operate um, on skeleton staff structures and, and how they can also reintegrate staff going forward uh, when we get to a point where the furlough scheme isn't, um, isn't suitable anymore. And then hopefully at the back end, looking at planning for growth as well. Uh, other additional topics, moving across from business, and as I said as well, research and development, because I think what we've always seen, again, with economic downturn, financial crisis as well, the best way a lot of companies can get out of these situations and get ahead of the pack for when we do get to that point of uh, the upturn in fortunes and the situations is to try and innovate your way out of it. So it's a very valid topic to reassess what you're doing, you know, see what you can change going forward, to try and innovate your way out of it and present yourself with new opportunities to get yourself ahead of the market in the pack so you've got that competitive advantage for when um, the situation um, improves. So there are my contact details. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity, Jordan. Thank you very much, Chris. So if you do have any questions for Chris, please type them in the Q&A and when we get to that part of the session, we can obviously Given. So, now moving on to Sarah, as the Director of Innovation and Engagement at the Norwich University of the Arts, Sarah is responsible for the university's relationships with business and the world of employment. Uh, with her early work in integrating employability experience, it was a subject of a Times Higher Award for Innovation and Excellence in 2015. Uh, an NUA profile, the subject of the keynote address today, is winner of a Guardian University Award in 2019 and were shortlisted for the Times Higher Awards. They share, uh, Sarah will be sharing her lightning talk remotely creative. So, Sarah. Okay, thank you, everybody. I hope that you can see my slide on screen. Has that worked well? That's good. Yep, okay. All good. So Jordan asked me if I would talk briefly about, uh, about how the universities responded and innovated in the face of the challenge and also how the creative sector in the region has. Um, I chair the creative sector for New Anglia, so we're very much in touch with those businesses and understand the sort of challenges they've had. So how can you remotely create and what have we learned along the way? 
so I'm not going to dwell on this, but just the effects of lockdown, um, it was it was carnage in the creative sector. I think next to the cultural sector, we were one of the sectors that was most badly hit by the pandemic initially. Um, and Creative Industries Federation did some research at the time that estimated that by the end of December, we would have lost 400,000 odd jobs from the sector. Um, some of the sectors that we look after, um, film, those kind of things were hit immediately. So that some of them were okay for about a month. And then as soon as the client pipeline ran dry, they, they really got into trouble. Um, and then from a university perspective, I've put a couple of quotes here from some research we did with our own students. I'm not gonna read them out because frankly, they're too depressing, but for our students at the time, they felt like their world had just fallen apart. Particularly the year three students who were gonna finish that year were thinking, goodness, what, what world am I actually going into here? Because nothing looks like I thought it would look. So starting off talking about how creative businesses innovated to, to meet the challenge. Of course, like everybody, they very swiftly took their business online and they stripped out unnecessary cost within that first month. For many of them, that meant that if they had shared office space or those kind of things that were costing them a lot of money in the city centre, um, they stopped with that, they started working remotely, and actually most of them have reported that they didn't really feel an adverse effect from doing that at the time. Um, many of them invested much more time in networking. Creative sector group that had been a quarterly thing went to a fortnightly meeting, and I know from the participants in that meeting that just staying in touch and understanding what was coming along and the help that they could access was really important but also things like Royal Telev Television Society, Hot Source and other meetup groups became incredibly important during that time. And people really invested in their colleagues in other businesses and what they could learn from other people's experience. Um, and of course, the industry got its act together and worked collaboratively to really sort out how things could work. Uh, by the early autumn, we had the British Film Commission guidelines that uh, told us all how to work safely on set. Um, the artists had gone online and really cracked how to do that. Uh, the Theatre Royal even worked out how to get audiences through safely in their auditorium, which was no easy thing. So there were lots of there was lots of good thinking there, lots of pivot. Um, and, you know, we did work out, I think, and all the businesses worked out which things in creative industries are very saleable in these circumstances. And obviously things like animation and games stand out there as being very achievable online and really enhancing people's um, digital and online um, presence. So, you know, I think that there was a picture there of people kind of, they exhausted every grant that we put them in touch with, they got involved with every scheme, and there was a lot of cross-sector working in our world as well to create new business and to try and move things along. And in the university at NUA, obviously, you know, like all universities, our curriculum sessions went online straight away, as did our events. But we did a lot more than that. And actually, I think I'm actually very proud of how we responded to it because we we looked into ourselves and said, right, we're a creative community here. So what can we do for our students to actually make this meaningful teaching, make their experience really good using all of the tools at our disposal? So we created all sorts of different um, teaching resources for them. We used animations. We realized that PowerPoints are actually very dry if you just work through them on your own. So we narrated those, we tried to make them more interesting. We went for interactive lectures. So we have a system now where one person lectures and another person works the chat. And that way we get students interacting with us, engaging with us in a very different way. Um, we looked at the talents that we had. So our curator who was sat there twiddling her thumbs a little bit because she couldn't put a gallery show on, started working instead in turning, pivoting her talents to say, how do you create, create yourself online um, and really helping the students with that. We worked a lot with our partners at Hethel. They helped us with skills analysis that we shared with our students and graduates with work around the geography of creative industry that we've been able to share. Um, we talk very much about mental health and resilience. Um, one of the things that we're big on in the university is gamification. It's, it's the principle that lies behind the things that we've uh, won the awards for that Jordan very kindly referenced there at, at the beginning. And we, we work a lot through um, experiences for the students that look a bit like games, usually based on card games or board games or those sorts of things. And we created experiences for the students around that to get them to talk about mental health get them to talk about resilience, 
How can you plan for resilience? You know, how can you actively build resilience? It's something that people talk a lot about, but how do you do that? Um, and we innovated in areas like um, uh, ASMR. So we've created all sorts of quite innovative resources for our students to positively manage their mental health, again, using the skills and the expertise that we have within a creative community. Other things that we do, we did, we, we relaxed for start. I think we all got to know one another much better. I think that friendships and relationships within our teams became hugely important. And actually we're probably a closer team now than we've ever been. Um, we still pushed things like our creative internship program and got uh, our graduates into different regional employers. And we certainly started to fully understand and really use social media in a very, very different way. And as a result, we grew our Instagram followers uh, March or September last year by almost 50 percent. This is the work that Hethel did for us. I won't go into it in detail, but you can see how you can imagine, I think, for a creative graduate finishing that year to have this kind of information about, you know, you can click on any of these and say, right, I want to go and work in bespoke tailoring. And you can use this map to identify exactly where those businesses are, what their name is, what their contact details are, and it's it's enabled all sorts of things for the students. This is an example of one of our little animations. It's ever so short, so I'll, I'll play it because it's because it's cute. This is our character Collie. He's um, he's uh, agnostic of uh, race, gender, all those different things, and we use him in lots of stuff. He's our kind of he's our careers um, person. So I hope you can see that, they're, I mean, they're, they're just a bit of fun, those animations, but actually for creative students, it makes a huge difference to have a varied communication that includes things like that. And, and actually, even in the making of those things, our team got closer. The voiceovers for those are all done by one of our team members, Will, who used to work in the Hethel team before he came to us at NUA. Um, he used to work in sound recording and all the sound was done um, on his bed with his quilt over his head to get the best possible quality. Um, so, you know, it was, it was a great experience to go through it. So now we're all building back uh, in creative industry. I mean, film production in particular in the region has a full book of, of production ahead. Um, the people up at Scotto Enterprise Park have all sorts of stuff that they're working on and they're all active again. There's a big new uh, TV series for Netflix that's being filmed up at West Raynham. So that, that part of our industry is very, very busy. Um, animation and games businesses survived well all the way through and now they're turning work away. You know, it's, a, it's become, I think so many uh, businesses in other sectors have understood how they can use those resources themselves to improve and enhance their digital presence that that has really worked. Um, and teams are expanding again um, as they understand how to onboard people in the digital space and so on, that all really works. And for us in the university, student engagement is on the rise. We've got better attendance now at sessions than we've ever had, actually, because a lot of students like working this way. Um, and the best news of all is that I looked for the first time last week at our graduate outcomes data. So this is like the, the data that shows how graduates are employed in this year for the 2020 graduating cohort versus the year before. And it's actually the same year on year, which we're so proud of because, you know, they, they can't uh, they can't travel for work. They, you know, they haven't been able to get a job in Costa Coffee and say that they're employed because there are no jobs in Costa Coffee this year. So this has all been about really being innovative and finding ways to connect themselves to employers. And we're starting to see the results of that coming through. So in a nutshell, for us, it is about innovation. It has been a lot about creative problem solving, and it's been a lot about uh, building teams back up again. And those are the things that 
we kind of excel at in a creative community and are very happy to, to work with other people on as well. That's it from me. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Sarah. So again, any questions for Sarah, please let us know in the Q&A and we'll, we'll ask them when we get to that part of the session. So moving on to Ismat. Ismat is a co-founder of Whilst, a circular startup which rents and refurbished, uh, re which rents new and refurbished homeware to students and young professionals. Our work has involved venturing into landfills and working with marginalised waste worker communities, witnessing overconsumption at its and creating a stubborn passion for driving a transition to the circular economy. It's Matt. Thanks so much, Jordan. It's lovely to be here amongst this very inspiring panel, especially following Sarah and seeing all the amazing work that's being done at NUA. Being in this sector ourselves, I think it's been such a tumultuous year and it's so in incredibly inspiring to see universities responding the way that they are. Um, so, so as Jordan said, I'm co-founder at Whilst. Um, my business partner and I actually met at the University of East Anglia. We were doing our masters there. Uh, I have a background in environmental science and she's a lawyer. And we were walking around the campus, very simple story, and saw these mountains of waste that students had left behind. And I'm sure for everyone who's attending this talk and who's moved around in their lives, they know what a burden it is. Um, and also how much waste is created, which is estimated at this moment in the UK at about 766 tons, uh, which is left behind by students and young professionals when they move. Um, so we figured that we're gonna solve this problem and we found three problems that we were gonna solve. Uh, one was obviously the waste. The second was that there, there exists at the moment no easy way for young people to buy and return things, um, especially millennials as they tend to move um, at least once in their lifetimes without the intention of permanent, permanently settling down. Um, and then there's a huge expenditure for universities and accommodation providers, of course, to manage that waste. Um, the solution seemed relatively simple at the time of conception, which is, of course, in the course of uh, actually being an entrepreneur, proved much more challenging, especially in the last year, and I'll get into that in just a minute. Um, so we rent our homeware, which includes for kitchenware and bedding. Uh, and at, when it's returned, we refurbish it and remanufacture it, and then we rent it again. So we offer both new and refurbished options to students and young professionals, also uh, to make it more affordable. And our mission is to provide alternatives uh, to short-term homeware pur pur purchases um, and create closed loop um, narratives. We were set up in 2018, so we're relatively young, but we've seen, um, thankfully, quite successful and exponential growth. We were able to raise grants um, uh, from UEA, also from Innovate UK, um, and test our model. We launched and tested in 2018. We were accepted to Cambridge Social Ventures, which is an incubator supported by Judge Business School, uh, where we've been surrounded by immense expertise and advice in our sector as well as peers, and I'll, uh, which has been um, incredible. And I'll get into that also in a second, how especially during COVID-19, the presence of other businesses and startups and peers uh, has been monumental. Um, at the moment, we are in the process of scaling to multiple cities across the UK. Uh, and we are also exploring potential growth to the Netherlands and Germany. Um, so that's that's us. That's where we are. I hope there are other businesses in the in the audience, and I hope you'll have some uh, challenging questions for me. Because what I've realized is this is where I learn when when people who you know when they are when people who aren't so familiar with us ask us the important questions, which has happened a lot during COVID. So that's amazing. <laughs> Um, so obviously when COVID struck, the first question we asked ourselves as a business is how do we help our customers and how do we help other people who are suffering at this time, right? Um, and how do we survive and how do we make sure we're resilient through this? Uh, so the first thing was that there was a massive logistical challenge, as you can imagine, as Sarah mentioned, students um, were in very tough situations. A lot of them just upped and left. Uh, because we went into lockdown, lots of them went back home. And so lots of our customers had to suddenly return the stuff that they had bought from us uh, because obviously it's on rent. Um, so we didn't expect our, our, our products to be coming back till September and suddenly we had them all back in March, a lot, like 70% of what we'd rented out the previous year. Uh, we had to find a warehouse at very, very short notice, uh, but we were able to, so 
I think the approach that we took for adapting to the situation that we had was how can we help the maximum number of people? So what we did, for example, with this warehouse challenge was that we went out and found businesses that were that had to move out of their premises but had to continue to pay rent because they were on uh, long commercial leases, for example. Uh, we found those businesses and we borrowed space from them. We sublet the space from them. So we could be, we would be able to help with their rent as well as be able to solve our logistical issue. So that's been our approach to COVID very much. Like how do we help the maximum number of people? Um, we've had to redesign our entire growth strategy. We were planning to scale up in 2020 as of many businesses uh, had to completely rethink what they do, why they do it. Um, and one of the things that we've been able to do very well uh, is um, undergo a rebrand. And in this branding process, really mine um, our thoughts, really go into a deep discussion with our team and understand the core of what we do. And that's been our driving force through COVID. Why is the circular economy important at this time? Why is it even more important for us to build back better and more um, environmentally um, and then of course, the last sort of thing that I'll touch upon is working remotely, which is a challenge that most businesses have faced this year as well as others. Um, we, were, we were, I think, particularly unfortunate because I was actually in India at the time visiting my family and I wasn't able to come back. So, and then since then my business partner had gone to her country and she wasn't able to come back here either. So in, the, in 2020, actually we've worked in the same country for three months. And the rest of the year, we've had to work uh, independently as well as our team, which is now scattered across the globe. Um, and some things that have worked for us is um, after a point, and as I'm sure is true for all the panelists as well as the attendees, Zoom just got too much. We got something called Zoom fatigue. So we've been trialing these different um, methods of having long conversations and working creatively. And I'm sure Sarah can um, help uh, figure out, uh, help uh, people in the on the attendees tell us what other methods creatively could be used. Uh, but we sort of went for walks. We used tools where you could use, you know, whiteboards and drawing online. And we had like virtual coffees in the park. Well, obviously now weather permitting, that's rather hard. But um, so th those are the kind of things that we've been we've been experimenting with. Um, and I think overall just like it's been good for students to be remote, I think it's been really helpful for us to be remote as well and to be able to work along um, our timings and not have the pressures of having to commute and not have the pressures of having to attend talks, et cetera, in London and Cambridge, which we were doing a lot. Um, yeah, well, obviously we miss it and we really miss meeting our peers, but I think overall we've managed to uh, handle remote working quite well. Um, so that's us. And I recognize that this is a really busy time and really difficult time for businesses, but I'm very happy to be here. And I'm very happy to have questions from other entrepreneurs or any, um, yeah, anybody who's thinking of it. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Ismat. We've got some questions coming in, so that's great. Keep them coming in. And we move on to our final speaker of the session. I'm not too sure who she is. Um, Imogen Jitterly, uh, somewhere from Hethel Innovation. Uh, and Imogen has experience managing EU funded business programs, as well as working in the clean tech and startup sector. Imogen is now innovation manager at Hethel Innovation, uh, managing the business development function with a particular focus on managing the 1.2 million pound EU funded business support program called Breakthrough. I'll hand over to you now. Thanks, Jordan. Um, when Jordan first asked me to take part um, in the session and to kind of answer the question of how do businesses innovate from home, I wanted to take a view um, of that question, both from the perspective of the businesses that we work with and we support, but also a bit of a personal view. So I've tried to think about um, three key themes um, that I think have been really important learnings for me personally and the businesses we've worked with over the last year and how um, kind of utilising these themes have actually helped us to innovate and be creative, particularly whilst we've been working from home. Um, so number one, I think, is communication. Quite ironic, um, we talk about communication and how communication is so important to when you're working from home, but I think for a lot of businesses, we still find that communication is not what it used to be. It's still not perfect particularly whilst we're all working remotely and, and away from each other. 
it's a big adjustment to go from, um, you know, having all your colleagues in one room and being able to, to share ideas that sort of come to you and then move to a whiteboard and, you know, lose yourself for 10 minutes, you know, drawing diagrams or, you know, expanding on that idea um, to being working from home and having that idea and not being able to get that instant feedback from colleagues. Um, so I think this is definitely something that we've improved at Hethel and personally it's something that I've tried to, to improve myself is making sure that we're able to communicate with each other as much as possible. Obviously video calls and instant messaging services makes that easier. Um, but actually something that's really helped um, our team, our business development team at Hethel is the fact that we run in an agile way we we use agile methodologies to actually do the work that we do so we have two week sprints that we work to so we plan out the two weeks ahead of us we know exactly what tasks we're doing we have daily meetings with each other to um, basically update everyone in the team on where we're at with those tasks and that transparency um, which is key to, to being agile is actually really important and has helped us tremendously to, to actually be communicating well with each other um, over the last year. Um, and, you know, I touched on the point about the fact that instant uh, feedback is really difficult to get whilst you're working remotely. So we've tried to do different things to actually allow try and bring a little bit of normality back to working so we do social working and that's actually been a big hit um with a lot of the the team um you know being on a call with each other not having to talk about anything just getting on with your work but you kind of you know I've got someone in my kitchen with me that I can talk to if I have a have an idea or I want that instant feedback um so social working has been something that's really um been beneficial for us a second theme that I think is really important if you want to sort of innovate from and be creative from home successfully, and that's collaboration. It kind of moves on from communication. It's being able to share those ideas and actually develop them further. Um, we've had to obviously adapt to a, um, collaborating online and using online platforms. So we've trialed out um, platforms like Miro and Whimsical, which are these sort of online um uh, collaboration platforms where you can you know, you've got your digital whiteboards you've got your post-it notes it's not exactly the same but it's actually something that um, we've found both internally and working with the businesses that we're supporting has been really helpful because it kind of again it's touching on the the idea of zoom fatigue it gives you another way um, another place to actually interact with people um, and also with collaboration it's kind of become a little bit more structured. So it's just planning and making sure you've got time booked out in your week to be collaborative with each other. So having um, review sessions, we've got sort of every week, we've got at least one meeting where all of our team is together and we're able to collaborate and review work and develop ideas further and kind of have that space to be creative with each other. Um, and then the final theme is space. Um, I think this is, been a personal one for me as well but it's actually having that physical space to be creative and take yourself away from your day-to-day -day job and give yourself the space to just be creative and innovate and develop ideas um so thinking about is there you know different positions in the room that you can set up your desk sometimes really weirdly just having a different perspective on the room can kind of just make you feel like you're in a different space and can sometimes make you feel a bit more creative or like you've got separation from your day-to-day -day work um going for walks um you know we're going to try our walking meetings that's something that we spoke about um the other week um within the team you know can we can we move away from just doing video calls and actually talk to each other and have space away from a screen um and also just sort of mental space as well separating um, your work day out I think it's very easy to just work from nine to five and because there's no distractions at home you kind of forget to take breaks and give yourself that space whereas actually that's where a lot of innovation takes place is when you're not kind of forcing yourself to be creative so actually giving yourself those breaks and um, setting up your day so you've got space to get away from your desk um, is definitely another theme that kind of comes up um, again and again both internally but also with the businesses that we're working with um, so yeah that's kind of what I was thinking about uh, I think they're the kind of three main things that have come up from the businesses that we've working with and actually have helped me personally to 
have that creative space from home. It's making sure that we're communicating really well. We've got that structure and that ability there to collaborate with each other. And that there's also that space to kind of take a step back um, and give, give yourself the opportunity to think outside the box. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Imogen. And thank you to all of the so far. So before we do launch into the Q&A section, one final poll. Um, and I'll allow, I didn't realise I could allow panellists to vote, so I'll allow you all to vote this time. Um, and what I want to ask is over the past year, which type of innovation has your organised focused on and benefited from the most? The product or service? Process, business model or plan? Is it the employee and the well-being, or is it the customer, the, the, the customer base that you are engaging with and, and selling to and supporting? It's always good to see we've got a nice diverse range of answers coming in. So I'll give you just another five or ten seconds to get your votes in the poll there. This is part of the reason why we've put on these series of events to learn more about the organisation, the businesses that are, that are kind of persevering through this difficult time. What exactly is going on behind those closed doors? So, share the results now. And interestingly, we've had the business model and the plan innovation, and also the employee and wellbeing innovation coming out the top and most focused on over the past year. Really, really interesting feedback there. So, getting my results now, and we'll move into the Q and A section of the session. Uh, and what we're going to do, we've got some pre-submitted questions um, ready to ask. And Ismat, seeing as you're going to be leaving slightly early, we'll we'll start with you. Um, the question we've got for you is: What has been the biggest barrier for you to set up and run a circular or sustainable business? And what would, advice would you give to fellow startups in this area? Thanks so much, Jordan. Um, it's such an interesting question because I wish somebody had asked me this question in 2018. <laughs> um, the first biggest challenge I think is that the way that business works normally is linear and that's the standard. So all services, um, even regulations, laws are set up around linear businesses. They're not set up for businesses that get the product back. What I mean by linear, sorry, just to clarify, is businesses, is any uh, product which is made, used and then thrown away. There's no end of life um, a process set up. So there's a lot of businesses now, for example, that even just do recycling, they collect and they do recycling with, their, with uh, the product upon return. But um, many still don't, of course, we know that this is a problem. Um, so the first big challenge is that nothing is set up for businesses which are circular. And what I mean by that is, so as simple as insurance, for example, getting insurance for our business has been an incredible challenge because insurance providers don't know where to categorize us. They don't know where our service fits. They don't know where our product fits. Um, obviously things are changing, especially in the fashion industry. There's a lot, there's so many startups and a lot of student startups, lots of young entrepreneurs are doing stuff with reusable, uh, returnable clothes, um, biodegradable fabrics. Uh, and I'm happy to have a chat if there's anybody in the audience um, who's interested in that. I am um, also a circular economy pioneer at the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. So we work a lot with other businesses that are circular as well. Um, but even things like Shopify and other e-commerce providers, they just there's no functionality even for software where you can actually get your stuff back. So all of our sort of asset management and tracking all our products is manual, uh, if you can believe it. And you can imagine how big a challenge that is, um, especially when you have products all over the country. Um, another thing has been with growth and fundraising. Uh, we found out quite late after we after we've obviously uh, been helped by Hethel a lot, been helped by in, uh, Invest East a lot, and also by the UEA as well as Cambridge, that we weren't eligible for SEIS and EIS angel investment, um, which, was, which was a big shock. And we figured that anybody who's renting and leasing actually isn't uh, eligible for angel investment. So that was 
So fundraising for us has been another challenge. Obviously, there are other as other avenues like crowdfunding and um, uh, you know family and friends rounds and these kind of things you can do. But lots of uh, and I'm sure if there are other startups in the audience, you know that lots of um, uh, early stage ventures do angel uh, investment as their first few rounds of funding to get going until they become um, cash positive. Um, there was also, of course, this as as young women entrepreneurs, as um, you know, people with uh, international uh, people here uh, having a team which is diverse. There was a lot of, uh, I think, pressure as a sustainable business to set an example and prove success so that it wouldn't dissuade other businesses from following in our footsteps and that other people, especially, um, you know, if we fail, there's this sense of like, oh, other people won't try because we failed. So that's what I'm trying to say, basically that it's, there's, and we've been given that advice. That's where it stems from. We've been given advice from our mentors, even from business advisors. Don't do this because somebody else did it and failed, you know? Don't do it this way because that's what happens. So I think there's this immense pressure on us to prove success, which is um, which if we were doing a non-sustainable, non-circular business wouldn't be the case because of course there's so much, um, there's so many examples of success. Um, and also there's less that can go wrong, I think. So, um, and I think the advice I would give to startups following up, following from this, these challenges that don't take any advice too seriously um there is of course there's good there's always going to be good advice and bad bad advice and you it will take years to to be able to discern what what works and what doesn't but i my advice would be my advice would be don't take any advice even my advice uh to seriously take everything with a pinch of salt um and question everything because your gut is more precious and more um um solid than you think it is and you should trust it more than you think you should, especially for people who don't come from business backgrounds. We have a tendency, and women, we have a tendency to second guess everything and constantly question ourselves. Um, and this is something that, that we've had to learn the hard way, that um, if you think something is gonna go wrong and people are telling you that it isn't, it's probably gonna go wrong. So <laughs> trust yourself and do what you think is right and also stick to what you want to do. If you want to create positive change in the world, which I'm assuming most sustainable businesses do, do it because that's what the world needs. Um, and the last thing is that anybody who's in this, any social enterprise, anybody who's working to work, and there's a lot of people now, especially who are setting up enterprises to help local communities, because that's what we're gonna to need to recover from COVID. Um, I think the thing to, to remember is that you can't solve all the problems in the world especially as a social enterprise, that's what you want to do. You want to make money and you want to solve all the problems and you're not going to do it all. So focus on the problem that you can solve. And that's what you'll probably be able to, and you won't be able to do everything good. Um, and yeah. obviously for people, sorry, who know this uh, and who are doing sustainable business, business is an incredible tool. And thank you for people to, like Hethel and Innovate UK and NUA for supporting us. Uh, because business is an incredible tool you we can create jobs we can create uh, you know um, money we can create prosperity and uh, all different kinds of wealth in communities and if you have the gift of this tool then make the most of it and talk to everybody you can because we can only get through it together so that would be mm. my advice Vin, thank sorry you. i just waffled on a bit I think, but... <laughs> <laughs> um, um, but then. As, brilliant. As Sarah is also leaving us slightly early as well, move on to a pretty intimate view, Sarah. Uh, and how do you see creative students working in, in typically not conventionally creative industries uh, in the future, particularly following COVID? That's, that's a great question. In fact, we have a project running right now, which is funded by the Local Enterprise Partnership called Connecting Creative Capability, which is just about that basically it's about getting creative graduates into all sorts of businesses that need their help that might not know that they do really we think that that again it centers on the three key areas that i talked about so our people are very good at problem solving they don't they don't have to be uh, problem solving in a in a creative area they just like solving problems and they will 
guarantee you go about thinking about stuff in a different way from a linear thinker. So that's always lovely to see. Innovation, obviously, you know, they're kind of hardwired for um, just give them some space to enjoy themselves and they will come up with great stuff. Um, and team building is the other stuff. You know, our people tend to be very good kind of people watchers. They understand and they intuit how other people work. So really, I mean, if any of the businesses on the call want to work with us in that kind of way, we've got some workshops coming up in those kind of areas, but also we've got a scheme later in the year where you can host uh, an intern from NUA and, um, and see for yourself what that can do, um, you know, available from any of our glorious disciplines from fine art all the way through to VFX or whatever you're interested in, that's, that's absolutely a possibility. Yeah, thank you very much, Sarah. I've got a question for you here, Louise. Um, have you seen a change or any trends in the way that health science and med tech startups and scale ups innovate and have grown amid COVID? Yeah, short sure answer yes. Um, <laughs> uh, we've, got, we've got a few, um, well, I think a couple of the other examples that I gave were in you know, the, the lightning talk and perhaps for attendees that, that weren't here, you know, I definitely think that, uh, Imogen, you mentioned the word collaboration, but it really goes beyond just within our own ex sector silos. So it really has, you know, COVID has, I think, fueled that cross-sector um, collaboration and partnership. Um, and I think that in itself, and this is something that I am working with on this Norfolk Suffolk Restart project, is very much around training the workforce for the future and, and actually can we start, uh, you know, as early as possible, and there are initiatives ongoing, but, you know, really training individuals to work across that and, and that cross fertilization sector you know let's get mechanical engineers in biotech companies and bring their fresh perspectives and vice versa um, so I, I think there's there's that element i think um, what what so i've got i'll give a couple of examples one is um, uh, an sme that we had we as an organization had worked with to pilot their um, their technology within um, hospitals within our region and we supported them to go through what we call as a scale-up academy. So really allowing them to take that sort of their base customer level up, you know, and spread nationally, but also internationally, as I alluded to earlier. And through that, and so they, they entered this scale-up academy, which again would normally have been a sort of two or three day classroom workshop and became a sort of an online forum over a few days a week for four weeks. Uh, I wasn't quite sure how that was going to play out, but actually it was it was much better than that classroom bit. Yes, I miss that physical piece of working with, um, uh, you know, the, the interact, the human interaction. But um, so they entered this with a very fixed model about what financing they wanted to go for. They've done a lot of grant funding, but they were right. We're going to go for Series A or seed, seed investment Series A. It was going to be quite linear to Ismat's um, sort of terminology as well. And throughout that process, there was a lot of um, thinking about some creative funding models. And actually, they've gone much more for a consortium kind of approach. You know, let's all co-develop this together. And then coming out of that, literally about six weeks later, and I do directly attribute our Scale Up Academy um, helping inform that thinking, they secured a, um, a £1.6 million contract with a large um, large corporate let's say and that's gone on to fuel their you know their their ambition and their scale up but I don't think Covid would have you know I think if we hadn't have had Covid and and those kinds of things it would have we'd have all gone on that quite traditional path together possibly I think the final one that I want to sort of highlight is we uh, and this is a video uh, video calls that have that enable us to just be in front of a screen all the time which yes that fatigue does set in but I think we as an organization we've been working with two SMEs one primary care network within our region and a large pharmaceutical company and each of them had an innovation to support patients with long-term comorbidities um, and long-term conditions 
it was about identifying and triaging those patients and then educating them after they've had their consultation with their GP. And what we've now developed, it, it felt like a bit of a hairball or a mushroom cloud at, at first, um, with all everybody coming together, what's everybody's sort of agenda, what we're we all trying to get out of it, but all coming together collaboratively with the same vision in mind of improving patient outcomes within primary care. And, and supporting the system. And, and I think if we hadn't had the COVID, you know, and that digital, us all pivoting to digital, we would still be trying to coordinate our calendars now to get all, all parties in the same room at the same time, which what a waste, what a waste of time, innovation, road miles, oh, just everything. Throughout the summer, when primary care, you know, the initial surge uh, subsided and things started to open up a bit, we were able to get on calls literally three times a week just to help iron out and to further, right, that suddenly changed. How does that affect the other parties in this, in this agreement? But I, I really think that gave us a, a massive opportunity and, and really exciting. And this is rolling out now in primary, across primary care. Clearly, there's a slight pause um, while the vaccine rollout is, is taking place, and rightly so. But it, it's there when the system's ready to think and engage, because these patients aren't going away. And actually, many of them are those most at risk for COVID as well. Sorry, you can see how passionate I am. So I'm going to No, it's fantastic. And I think it's really, really um, obvious in certainly in the work that Hethel does, and I'm sure as well as Sarah said about because COVID has, has made us work from home and remotely and we're able to bring people together more effectively. So that collaboration is now easier to achieve. Sarah was saying that students are taking part in networking a lot more effectively and it's becoming more available. This is allowing innovation to take place uh, much easily, more easily. So I'll move on to Chris's question, which is of the many businesses, many of the innovative businesses that you've supported through um, Enterprise Europe Network and now Innovate UK Edge. What would you say is a common trait that more successful business leaders have shown over the past 12 months? Thanks, Jordan. Um, very good question. I think the most important trait for successful business leaders would be being organised. I think um, Imogen obviously mentioned the processes that you have in place around um, agile management and the two week processes that you look at. But I think any kind of business owner has to have a very clear, um, distinct, short-term, medium-term and long-term plan. So I think if you're talking about innovation, you could separate these two plans out for a whole holistic business plan, but then also specifically around an innovation project as well. But I'm very surprised by the amount of SMEs that I work with. And this can range from someone, a one-man band turning over 100 a year to you know a 40 person company turning over 25 million a year how they don't have a good business plan and structure to what they're doing and i think this is important both internally and externally because you have to have clear goals deliverables and achievables for business internally so that whether you're working on your own or with a team that everyone knows what they're doing and what they're aiming towards but also, if you're going to be going through processes of fundraising, whether it be for private investment or public sector grant funding, you need to have a very clear proposition for your innovation product or your business, but also the long term plan for that as well. So if you're going for any kind of investment, they're looking for a kind of three to five year plan, but also you have to have a very clear exit strategy. So whether you want to be building this company as your own baby and running it for the length of your career, or if you want to be having um, a sellout within five to six years, you have to have a very clear plan as to how you want to get to that point and what you're going to be doing in the years, the months to be able to get to that kind of activity. And so this has been a very important trait to really getting companies in a better point for surviving the current crisis and then getting out of it as well because obviously these plans are good to have in place but they are fluid as well and you obviously have certain circumstances such as a pandemic or whatever that might impact and change those but then even coming to a point where you have contingency plans where there might be 
situations where an order falls through or a pandemic or whatever and knowing what you can do if those situations arise obviously you know we've had a pandemic which we probably haven't had in the last 200 years or whatever since something like the spanish flu but you know so it's very novel for a for a business owner to try and adapt and see what can happen with that but now you know this has happened in china before and i've had companies that have dealt with china through the bird flu crisis 10 years ago and so they were better placed to actually change and react to situations that might arise through that so the planning is key and having that organizational structure is is really really important to survive and then also thrive in these situations one thing that i also see with with companies the the difference between you know, someone who wants to do well and trundle along and someone who wants to really scale and grow a business is the difference between being proactive and reactive. Some companies, when they get out into the marketplace, they have a bit of success. They might just sit on their uh, rest on their laurels and be reactive to opportunities. And that will get you some money through the door for a few years. But, but you know, someone will innovate and get ahead of you. And, you know, you will lose your position in the marketplace. So it's a case of always being proactive around innovation, client engagement strategies, you know, management, managing your clients effectively as well. So those, the organization kind of leads on to other activities, being proactive and, and things like that, but having a good structure and plan for your business, for your employees, and, you know, make those targets very achievable and, and help yourself along the way as much as you can. I think that's been reflected as well, Chris, in the answer that we got for that last poll, the majority or the kind of highest answered um, type of innovation that we've experienced over the last year is the business model or the business plan innovation. Like you said, being organized, having these contingency plans, the short term, medium, long term um, objectives has been, has been really um, focused upon this year. Exactly. Uh, so and this can apply to any kind of business, whether you're a high tech firm, or if you're running a corner shop, you, you've got to have these business plans in place for whatever you're doing. So it applies to everyone. It's a really good process to do. As I said, whether it's just for your own internal processes and procedures or whether you're going out fundraising as well, you know, it's, it's really key to have that structure in place. Brilliant. So Imogen, final uh, closing question was, what advice would you give to businesses uh, in 2021 they want to focus on innovating in their business? I think the advice I'd give businesses in 2021 who want to innovate is be agile and to have the courage to listen to your customers and your target market. Um, I think um, everything Chris was saying is completely right about having business plans and having, you know, uh, plans set out for um, what you want to do with your business. But I think there's also something to say with um, being able to adapt and not being afraid to do so, not being afraid to listen to the customers that you deal with and be aware of any of their requirements or their needs change so that you can fit those requirements and therefore keep your target market. You know, that's if, if your customers change what they need and you're not changing your product or your service, then you lose your customers because they're not going to purchase it anymore. So I think um, the biggest piece of advice I'd say is just to, to not be afraid to listen to your customers and to, to be agile and adapt to a changing market, which I'm sure will continue to change over the next year as it has last year. Yeah, thank you very much. Has anyone got anything to add to that? A question from the panel, How? what advice would you give to businesses wanting to focus on innovation in 2021? Anyone from the panel wants to take that? Or do we want to move on to the Q&A questions? I guess we can move on to the Q&A questions or is Matt, I saw you unmuting, does that mean you want to get involved? Uh, I just wanted to have, I just wanted a, a quick add on to what Imogen was saying, because I think that's not been, um, I think that's been our biggest learning, which has been uh, to listen to our customers and understand what they're going through and then respond to that. Um, a lot of businesses, when you're being, when you're building, you just tend to think of the executive and, you know, when you're in the management of it, like the everyday or like, infinite to-do lists, you kind of forget um, how to be empathetic to your customer. And I think that's the most important thing when you're making your business plan and doing all of the really important work, 
just keep that in mind of course jordan has been absolutely monumental in in helping us with this so um yeah for us it was about building trustable content our customer base has gone through a very traumatic experience this year and just recognizing that and being empathetic to it uh, has paid off um so just wanted to add that brilliant that there as well um of yeah I, I think that's that's so important and i think not only customers but when we're also talking about different types of customers such as agents and distributors or licensing partners i think the whole pandemic has actually presented a new opportunity where typically an SME who's got these kind of sales channels overseas, they might go and visit them once a year to see how things are progressing. I think what we've encouraged customers to do because we use some video conferencing technology is to actually get in touch with these, uh, these customers and manage the relationships more effectively because you could easily have a half an hour Skype or Zoom or Teams call once a month and it's got to be a nice balance from being personable and having, you know, off the record chats as well as talking business. And I think the more you can grow those relationships, you can actually make them work more effectively for your business and be more productive. So we've actually been talking with a lot of customers to, to revisit their international strategies and how they operate with these different sales channels. And then obviously, you know, what can you do on a more regular basis to make it more effective and to build and strengthen those relationships? So, yeah, very, very valid point. I mean, it's, it's worth uh, worth mentioning that, of course, not only just start, start selling directly to consumers, but also other sales channels that you have and managing and working on those relationships. Brilliant. Thank you very much. So going to the Q&A uh, section now, um, I believe... Bill had a question which has been answered um, by Louise in the chat. Bill's question was, does the panel have any suggestion for innovatively testing product or market fit? Because innovation is only useful if the market wants it. I was wondering, Louise, if you wanted to kind of share your answer in a bit more detail, if, if you can, or to expand upon it at all. Yeah, sure. So thank you. And and uh, I was just giving my my perspective from from the sector I'm I'm aiming from. So um, Phil, I'm not sure if you're still on the line, but um, yeah, in in essence, we um, so the re reason that the academic health science networks that there are fifteen across England is so that we are embedded within our local geographic cluster and within our health and care system and so that we know what those specific needs are um, based on our demographic and some of the um, let's say some of the challenges for geography of some of our regions so in East Anglia and that's where Eastern um, cover you know we've got obviously city hotspots and then we've got large swathes of rural uh, you know, rural areas, for example. So it's really about understanding the health inequalities that exist across our region. Um, those have increased, let's say, um, it, with COVID. Um, There's no, no denying that. We're trying to bridge that. There's a lot of funding out there to, to support that. But I think to test an innovation, if, for example, it was to get that clinician or that user interface, and that, that user might be a patient or a member of the population. So again, I'm, I'm assuming it might be on the clinical side of things. So we've got those relationships there from our region, but we also, we host what's known as the Citizen Senate. So a group of um, sort of innovation hungry individuals from, from across the East of England that will be very, um, very happy to provide their perspectives of that will, will work because of X, it won't work because of Y. And, and again, coming back to some of Ismat's um, comments earlier, um, you know, that's perhaps one person's perspective, but certainly we, um, when there's an innovation that we're looking to really take forward and, and get, get behind with a lot of our time and, and some of our, our um, funding from NHS England, we'll put those technologies in front of what we call our innovation review panel. And that's stakeholders from the system, from grant awarding bodies, such as um, the Knowledge Transfer Network, could be Innovate UK, the population, so that we get this breadth of opinion. It's not just Louise Joplin's opinion on that particular Friday. Um, 
so we can broker those introductions and and again we've got we work with a lot of um, manufacturers so if it's a particular you need a prototype developed and some iterative um, uh, approaches for that obviously Hethel you know you you guys that's your bread and butter as well so you know we we've, we've got those networks as well so I think there's a number of um, facets Phil dependent if you if you if it is a healthcare innovation if there's any examples but I'll put my email in the chat and I'll be happy if any of the audience and, and Phil yourself want to contact me directly about that I hope that helps Brilliant. I imagine, Dave, if you want to expand upon that. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll add to uh, that as well, really. So obviously, I think there's a wide range of public uh, sector funded and also private organisations that can, can help in this situation. One of the problems we always find with SMEs that are developing new innovation is getting this kind of customer feedback, getting the market research in place as well, especially if you're going for a grant. You have to really be able to define the marketplace, your potential addressable market as well. And it's, it's a really daunting task for a lot of small companies to try and gather and go on that information to be able to put it forward into your proposition. So there are different bodies that can help out with this. You don't have to be going to a market research company or consultancy that's going to charge you thousands of pounds. Um, on the government side of things, um, we have sector specific organisations such as the catapult centres. So in the east of England, the one we have in our region is the offshore renewable energy catapults. Um, and there's also ones from other sectors across the UK as well, that they have resources that you can tap into for, for testing, for consumer feedback, for market research as well. And, and whilst we, as our service, we, we tend to be generalists, we all have our own sector specific background, but also Louise touched on it as well, the knowledge transfer networks. They're also funded and delivered by Innovate UK, but they tend to be more sector specific. So they will have specialists in different areas. And again, they can help you get in touch with the right people, gather the right kind of consumer feedback, set up those feedback channels, but also do testing, market research, and those kind of things. So that's the public side of things. Obviously, private, you know, Louise, you touched on it again about you know, business centers. Uh, there are a wide range of business centers that can do this activity. There are business networks as well. So they look like some kind of Cambridge Clean Tech, the Water Innovation Network, or a couple that I deal with quite regularly in the east of England, very similar to what Louise does with regard to um, you know the health sector as well. So there are plenty of places that you can you know, get this kind of help and support, but it's obviously knowing about this and getting in touch with the right kind of people that I'm certain assess that between ourselves and all the panelists today, we can obviously help you point you in the right direction. Thank you, Chris. Anything to add on that, Imogen? Um, just to kind of reiterate what's been said already, I think, um, Phil, you, your question's spot on. That there is a real need to make sure that your uh, that businesses are developing um, new products or new services that are needed by the market that they're selling to. Um, it's really important to to test your products before sort of building and launching them straight away. We're at Hethel, we're real advocates of. Um, lean product development um, so you know making the most um, lean and efficient uh, version of a product a new product or a new service that you can and then taking it to your customer market and testing it with them and getting the feedback and uh, making sure that you use that feedback to actually uh, make sure the the product is perfect and we we do that specifically through some of our training but also we run design sprints with businesses where we have that that fundamental theme at, at its core we work um with businesses over sort of two to five days and those design sprints are all around developing an idea and coming up with a with a product idea but the most important step arguably in that design sprint is taking that uh, minimum viable product um, and taking it to customers and getting the feedback and then going back and, and actually making incremental changes to the product until you get it to a place where you're able to sell it and uh, you have a market there who will actually invest in it. So, um, you know, agree with what's been said already. Yes, it is incredibly important to test your products and there are a number of ways that you can do it. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Chris, we've got a question for you here. Uh, and Ryan asked, is it, it uh, sorry, is any of the Innovate UK programme tech specific? Was it targeted at the clusters? 
for SME? So, um, as I touched on in response to the last question, there are sector-specific um, support provisions, but also funding programmes as well. So, there are generic support programmes, that's one of our areas. But as I said, the knowledge transfer networks, they tend to cover pretty much all of the different industries and sectors within the UK. Um, also, the passports, um, where they have physical centres, where they can do demonstration testing and business support as well. And then going across to the funding provisions, um, as I said there, well, across the whole of UK government, there's a split between Innovate UK and also the research councils. So there are specific research councils that have their own funding pots, so that, such as the Medical Research Council, which has got a huge amount of backing at the moment because of the COVID uh, situation. But also Innovate UK, they have a nice split between generic open funding programmes for any kind of innovation uh, project. And also, as I touched on in my presentation earlier on, uh, the Industrial Strategy Challenge Fund, which aligns with the key industrial strategy areas that the government's focusing on. And obviously, I, I said as well about clean growth being one of the key ones at the moment, which fits very nicely with companies as well, such as um, um, whilst as well, when we talked about how things like resource efficiency, um, environmental tech and you know, carbon footprint reduction, things like that. So, yes, you, you have to keep an eye on what kind of priorities are for government for funding as well, because there might be something that's actually a really, really good specific fit for you, but there are backup options. And, and as I said, you know, there, there is support for any kind of company out there, whether you want to be really kind of sector specific or you want general support across a range of business topics through companies like ourselves and a lot of you guys that have them as well. Brilliant, thanks for that, Chris. Um, just as we wait for any more questions to go through, I'd like to ask a question to, to all of you. And in, in your experience, what makes a great innovator? I don't know who wants to take that first. I'll go first. Um, I think there are many things that make a great innovator, but I think courage is a big part of it. It's not being afraid to take risks um, and develop something that's completely new um, and never been done before. So I think for me, courage is the the big the big skill for a um, a, a good innovator. Brilliant. Who wants to take the floor next? I'll, I'll go for that. So Imogen, I think that's that's a really really valid point. I think also it's a case of knowing your own limitations as well because. I think it's really difficult to find someone uh, or an innovator that has both the technical and the commercial now um, for developing and then subsequently exploiting and uh, monetizing an opportunity there as well. So being able to say, right, I need help or I need to build a strong team that has all of the capabilities that can make you know, our innovation a success. So, so I think that's very key with many kind of innovators as well. Louise. And I'll just add to that, I was going to use the word passion, because I think it's that, you know, sort of perhaps sort of um, is an adjunct to um, the courage, but definitely you have to have that when people are telling you, no, this is never going to work, it's never been done this way before, you've got to have that, well, the courage, but that passion to, to take you forward in, in the darkest of days. Um, and I think as well, it also leads on to, um, to Chris's point, is that humility. I think it's being able to take feedback, um, some, much of which you may not want to hear, and yes, much of which might just be that person's opinion, but having that humility not to sort of burn bridges, alienate those that perhaps are, you know, are giving up their time to even listen to your, your technology. Um, and I think also just to bridge onto Chris's point about your own limitations, this is part of the discussion we have with some of our SMEs in that startup and then going into that scale up phase. And this is throughout the scale up academy. Often they have to look at themselves. This has been their baby for the last 10 plus years. They may not be the chief exec when, uh, you know, they're the CEO today and they have been. Just because that's been the case to date doesn't mean that is the right thing for the company and the innovation in the next five to 10 years. And so actually it's that humility and that recognition that is this the best thing for the 
organization and for getting the technology to where it needs to be? Do I need to bring in those skill sets? And actually, do I need to step back? Brilliant. Thanks for all of your really, really interesting answers. So we've got two minutes left and I can't see any more um, questions coming to the Q&A section. So I'm going to take this opportunity um, to thank all of the panellists and the speakers today, as well as for all of you who have, who have joined us uh, this morning. Um, like I spoke about previously, this is the first of a series of three events. Um, this has been How to Innovate. Next week, we have How to Collaborate and the week after How to Lead. Next week, we're going to be joined by Penny Bartram of Cambridge North Tech Corridor, Katie Fisher of The User Story, Lucy Summers and Jake Sutcliffe of Indigo Illusions, James Williamson of Name, and Andy Narayan Barrett of Heffel Innovation. So thanks again um, to everyone who has joined us today. And um, hopefully you've enjoyed the session. We'll see you next week. <laughs>